The Printing Press by Mary Sickes. A book is only in the first place a physical object, a collection of sheets of paper or other substance, blank, written, or printed, fastened together as to form a material whole. It is widely believed that the invention of the book coincided with the invention of the printing press. This, however, is not correct, and in fact, according to Christopher Keat, Tim McLaughlin, and Robin Parmar, the creators of the Electronic Labyrinth, the practice of the printed book dates back before the Diamond Sutra, which was produced in China in 868 CE, the earliest dated printed book. It was not until almost six centuries later that block printing made its way to Europe, and it was some time after that when Johannes Gutenberg invented movable type in various widths and combined this new technology with old, including block printing, parchments, inks, and a hand press to create the printing press, which changed the literary world forever. It is impossible for us to truly imagine or reconstruct what life was like prior to the invention of the printing press. In the words of Elizabeth Eisenstein, Reconstruction requires recourse to printed materials, thereby blurring clear perception of the conditions that prevailed before these materials were available. As a society, we understand that the printing press changed the quality, quantity, and distribution of written texts enormously, and one could say, as Francis Bacon did, that movable type and the printing press indeed changed the appearance and state of the whole world. Today we are so far removed from the origins of the printed book and Gutenberg's printing press itself that we cannot fathom a life standing at a bookstand to read a novel. Neither could Gutenberg have imagined an iPad as a reading tool. As J. David Bolter points out, Gutenberg might well have been appalled at the thought of someone taking his beautiful folio-sized Bible to bed. Prior to the invention and development of the printing press, written materials were produced by either the church or the court and literacy was a privilege granted to clergy in the upper class. In this way, the church played an important role in the regulation of information. Who was given the privilege of being literate, as well as what was read, was strictly controlled. Books were incredibly expensive to make, and as they were created by hand in places like medieval monasteries, the process was extremely time-consuming. Monastic scribes would copy manuscripts for hours each day, and professional scribes were hired to copy books as the demand grew greater. In reference to both the work of Harold Innes and Plato Phaedrus, Neil Postman draws attention to the knowledge monopolies created by important technologies, and the fact that those who cultivate competence in the use of a new technology become an elite group that are granted undeserved authority and prestige by those who have no such competence. As the church and upper class held the key to literacy, an elite was created and maintained based on the literary technology and controlled competence of the time. It was during the 15th century that the demand for more books increased, making this a perfect time to introduce new technology to mechanically produce greater numbers of books. Gutenberg's first attempt was funded by banker Johann Foss. Gutenberg used the money loaned by Foss to design a font of type, which we now refer to as B36 with a Paris-educated scribe by the name of Peter Schoeffer. This first attempt at a font was deemed too large, but it was used to produce a 36-line Bible printed by Gutenberg in 1458. For a second attempt, additional funding was needed, at which point Post became Gutenberg's partner. During the second attempt, Gutenberg and Schoeffer developed a 42-line type, now referred to as B42 type which was used to produce the 42-line Bible, which we know today as the Gutenberg Bible. The technology of book printing spread rapidly. As the demand for printed books continued to grow, printing workshops were established throughout Europe. By the 1470s, printing presses were being used in most countries in Western Europe, and by the end of the century, every major city in Europe had a printing shop of some form. One might wonder how scribes fared in the rapid development of the printed book. However, Richard Clement assures us in medieval and renaissance book production that the image of the sudden demise of scribal culture at the hands of the printers is greatly exaggerated, as many former scribes were able to find employment as printers, chancers, and notaries. With the invention of the printing press, the cost of literary knowledge began to decline. As Innes points out, the monopoly built up by guilds of copyists and others concerned with the making of manuscripts had its effects 
in high prices, which in turn invited attempts to produce at lower costs. Early printers produced more books than could be sold, which caused prices to plummet, with the result being that a printed book cost about 20% or less than that of its manuscript counterpart. CBC Radio's The Great Library 2.0 draws our attention to the fact that by the 16th century, printing presses were churning out books at dramatically reduced cost compared to monks copying them out one at a time, and with the drop in publishing costs, demands for new books and new knowledge skyrocketed. By 1470 in Paris, it was estimated that a printed Bible was approximately one-fifth the cost of a manuscript Bible. As the printing press was further developed, the number of materials produced drastically increased, while both the time and cost needed to produce the materials significantly decreased. As with any new technology, the printed book was not well received by everyone. Ceci tuera cela. This book will destroy that building commented the priest in Victor Hugo's Notre Dame. This quote illustrates the fear held by many in religious authority that the printing press and its related increase in literacy would ultimately undermine the authority held by the church. Human thought could be influenced on a much broader scale, and the mode of expression would change dramatically. As Innes highlights in Empire and Communications, the monopoly of monasticism was further undermined. The authority of the written word declined, the age of cathedrals had passed. The age of the printing press had begun. Until this point, the medieval cathedral, with stories held within its stone walls and statues and stained glass, had been a library for the religious and a symbol of Christian authority. As James O'Donnell reminds us in the Cambridge Forum broadcast from Papyrus to Cyberspace, there were people who didn't like printing in the 15th and 16th centuries. And if they said, in the 15th century, that if you allow people to print these books, pretty soon heterodox ideas will be spread across European civilization. It will be harder to maintain theological orthodoxy. It turns out they were right, and at the same time, it turns out that the cost they might have imagined incurring from that loss of orthodoxy turned out in one way or another to be manageable. We did not need, quite as desperately as we thought we did, perhaps in the 15th century, to live in a world in which everyone shared one body of principles, one body of creed, but they share in common. What the printing press ultimately did was encourage collaboration and create new opportunities for cultural and educational development. Eventually, everyone benefited from the new technology created by Gutenberg. Students who had previously been reliant on educators to grant them access to scholarly texts were now able to access materials independently. The number of written works available was increasing as new ideas were also being presented and considered. With these new ideas and concepts, there was, of course, resistance to change. However, despite this resistance, printed materials such as reference guides, charts, and maps were quickly accepted as they were recognized as beneficial tools by all. In addition to a general increase in scholarly and academic skill-related development, printing presses encouraged the collaboration of various professionals who had not previously worked closely together. Eisenstein draws our attention to the fact that professors and printers began to engage in fruitful collaboration almost as soon as the new presses were installed. In addition to this professional collaboration, astronomers and engravers, physicians and painters were brought together resolving older divisions of intellectual labor and encouraging new ways of coordinating the work of brains, eyes, and hands. As the availability of printed books increased and they became more affordable to the general public, the demand for books printed in languages other than Latin increased. Printing establishments began to print books in common languages rather than limiting works to scholarly Latin as had been the common practice which meant socioeconomic groups who had never before been given access to written materials were now able to access texts. As Elizabeth Eisenstein points out, indeed, Latin reading professional groups profited from new kinds of book learning just as much as did untutored artisans. This in turn meant that literacy became accessible to more than the religious order and the upper class. Eisenstein states that insofar as the vernacular translation movement was aimed at readers who were unlearned in Latin, it was often designed to appeal to pages as well as apprentices, to landed gentry, 
cavaliers and courtiers, as well as to shopkeepers and clerks. Literacy became an increasingly attainable skill and ultimately was no longer a privilege granted only to an elite group. Over the course of centuries, literacy has been transformed through the development of numerous technologies, though never more so than with the invention of the printing press. Our understanding of literacy has been shaped by this extraordinary invention, and even as we continue to develop technologies at an ever-increasing rate, we cannot underestimate the power of the printing press on literary history and its development of literacy as we know it. In the words of John Culkin, we shape our tools, and thereafter, they shape us.